describe as the second video, which is going to be, uh, let's call it, what is sales? Now, when I say what is sales, what I mean is to a sales engineer. So, let's start out with a couple things. First, the definition of sales. Um, the first thing on our list is define sales. <clears throat> now, again, we're talking about for a sales engineer, not for a, well, I guess it could be for a sales rep, but I mean, it's good for you to know, but um, from a sales engineering perspective, what is the definition? Well, a lot of folks will say the exchange of, let's call it a commodity, for money. Sounds pretty good. I think a better one might be, and uh, I'm going to, this is one I found online and modified a little bit, to transfer in the case of goods to or render in the case of services, professional services, whatever, for another in exchange for, we can say dollars, but yeah, for the case of a sales engineer, it's always going to be dollars. Or you could say to dispose of to a purchase price. It's not always as simple as I'll give you money, you give me the thing. And I say that because there are times when you will have scope creep where the customer or the prospect, you're, you're the customer rather, you're giving the service to, it says, well, how about, a oh, could you go look at this? Could you do that? And they want more and more and more for what they already paid for. The other is free consulting. Free consulting is when you are convinced in the sales process to give away what you normally would charge for. For example, let's suppose you gave a design to your prospect and said, here's my design for what I think you should purchase from me. They go, great. And they take that and they give it to somebody else and they go, okay, company B, competitor number one, what would you charge me to do that? So it's not always as simple as dollars. I just want you to, to, to remember that. Now, the source for sales, uh, the, the term sales, right around 1050 from what we call late old with an E English to uh, middle English and it comes uh, they believe from the Norse word Sala or in Proto-Germanic, Germanic, it was called Salo. In Swedish, S-A-L-U. In Danish, S-A-L-G. And interesting, then P-I-E, if you know, this is Proto-Indo-European. The root is S-A-L, the root for this word. This root means to grasp or uh, get or uh, 
to take. Interesting. Now, the Roman soldiers, I'm sure you've all heard, they used to be paid in salt. And they needed this for the horses or any livestock they might have. Because mining this was very, very uh, labor intensive, and so it was worth a lot. And uh, the words that we get from this, I know some of you have heard about this, uh, salary, uh, salary, <laughs> salary, <laughs> salary, and have you ever heard anybody say they're worth their salt? Or your grandparents might say they're earning their salt, salt of the earth, that kind of thing. They're talking about the value of salt, which is kind of where we get sales from. Interestingly, the Romans, when they had their greens, they were called their greens, these were really bitter. And what they did was they used uh, salt and the salt would work with the greens to make them a little bit less bitter. And this is where we get the word salad. Again, the root being sal. So this is where this is where all this comes from. Again, like I said, very laborious to do this. Uh, the Romans would take seawater and they would put it in large vats and boil it. And because it took so much to boil water, I mean, right, you have to keep this flame going and boil everything down in seawater, it used up a lot of resources. It used up a lot of wood that they could have been using to make ships or whatever else. So the biggest thing to remember, I think, out of all of this is that it's to take not necessarily an exchange like we currently refer to this today. Now an interesting statistic for you is that one in nine Americans are in sales. One out of every nine people in America are salespeople. That's what they do for a living. Now, you might say, well, all right, but we just talked about a couple of things in the first video that make that a little, little fuzzy. They say, okay, one of the key things, and certainly the first thing that you do as a salesperson is your prospect, right? You're looking for people to buy your stuff. So they call it prospecting, like a prospector would go out looking for that vein of gold. And I would say this is, it's big, but it's also the first step. So, I mean, you mess this up, you're not getting much further. So, you might say, well, thank goodness I'm one of those eight and nine. I don't have to worry about this. I don't have to worry about prospecting, cold calling, all that other stuff we talked about in the first video. Not me. I've got a respectable job. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if you do. Have you... Let's just ask a couple of questions here. Have you ever looked for a date? Well, you know what I mean. Have you ever interviewed for an employee? In other words, people are looking to you for a job. Or my favorite, have you ever shopped for anything? Be honest, have you ever shopped for anything? You know what you were doing? Each one of these, you're prospecting. Prospecting is looking for a match. In this case, hey, you might be looking for a husband or a wife. 
you're trying to find the best employee out of a bunch. You're trying to figure out which mayonnaise is going to work out for you based on price, worth, and value. So you're choosing between lots of different things. You're prospecting. I say, therefore, that you are in sales. Now, I didn't say that your job title was salesman or saleswoman or salesperson or whatever the PC word is. I'm simply saying that you are in sales every single day and you don't even know it. Now, with that, when we said that one every nine are in sales, I can amend that now, can't I? I can say that eight out of nine Americans are also in sales, but they're in what I call indirect, or some writers call non-sales, which is even more confusing, sales. You don't have the word sales in your job description on your business card, do you? But you're a salesperson, and you might even be really good at it. If you interact with people. So here's you, and here's them. If there's anything like this going on, talk, email, you're publishing, you're on a website, a blog, or whatever, you're in sales. You're selling something. Have you ever had to convince your kid to make their bed, to clean their room, to do the yard, to stop doing something, to get better grades? Have you ever had this kind of an interaction with your kids? Think about it. You're selling. Now, just like we said before, it's a service or it's a whatever, but you know what? When we focused on the dollars, I said, yeah, that's good for sales engineers. But it might be, oh, I don't know, a gold star from the teacher. It could be allowance money. It could be do this and I'll let you stay up late tonight. Play video games or watch TV or whatever. I'll give you this if you give me this. So you wonder then, wait a second, if I'm in sales, if everybody's in sales, then why the bad rap? Why, when you say you're in sales, does everybody go, oh, you're like Herb on WKRP. You've got that plaid suit. You're a used car salesman, Royal Fuchs. And I'll tell you why. Back in the day, we used to have what was called asymmetric or offset knowledge. So here is you, as the customer, doesn't matter, whatever it is, and here is salesperson. Could be anything, could be a car, could be an appliance, could be whatever. Back in the day, and this reminds you a lot of how medieval science and such came to be in the dark ages, who had the knowledge about the thing? The thing. So here's our little box got a nice little ribbon on it. Who knew more about this box? You or them? Well, to be honest, in the day, the rep knew a lot about it. You didn't know that much about it. Where was your internet? Where was your research? Where were your five-year-old to ask about it, right? Because today the five-year-old knows everything. So when you don't know much about something, and your level is here, and their level is here, what does that create? This disparity, or some people call asymmetrical because it means it's not even, it's lopsided, this created suspicion. 
on the part of the customer. They never knew if they were getting ripped off. They never knew. Because what did I know about a car? How did I know that this car had better mileage than any other car? How did I know the safety rating of this, that, or the other? People were just as lazy back then. They didn't go and look all this stuff up. Oh, don't worry. It's great. It's wonderful. It's going to save you all kinds of money. It'll be great. Don't worry. Sign here. Right? They knew that we were stupid. And so a lot of suspicion came from this area right here. Now, I think we had a right to be suspicious, but we shouldn't necessarily have painted all salespeople like this. It just became very, very, very easy with no repercussions for salespeople to take advantage of us. That's all. We created this situation. We certainly can't complain too much about it. But what happened? Well, over the course of time, information became cheap, became easy to get. One of the side effects of the internet, other than telling us all how to make bombs or get bad movies, was we started to learn a lot of information and a lot of minutia about the same stuff that the rep knew about. This is called symmetry. In other words, they're equal. So now when the rep said, oh, it's just as good as whatever, you'd say, uh, no, actually, I read where it's completely the opposite. Oh, well, then I'll just have to drop my price a little bit or something like that. So the whole idea of negotiation came into play here recently when we came into the information age that just wasn't there for your parents and the grandparents. And we now can challenge people. I go into a store uh, just the other day. I was at Staples. And I have my smartphone with me and an Amazon scanner. And I was using their Wi-Fi to do this. I log onto their Wi-Fi. I scanned the barcode on the back of a, um, oh, it was, I think it's this eraser here. And I immediately got a to my door price with my Amazon Prime uh, with everything else that was about a dollar cheaper than I would get there plus the sales tax uh, and walk out the door with it. Was I going to wait the two days or, or whatever? I knew instantly without asking anybody, just sitting there in the aisle, within about 30 seconds, whether I was going to pay too much for this eraser. That kind of power our parents and grandparents never dreamed of. You can go now into a used book sale, used bookstore, go to the ISBN, or even scan the title of the book, and immediately see on Amazon what that book can be resold for. So if they're selling it for five cents, I can just turn around and sell it for a dollar. People make a lot of money doing just that. And that's what information and technology has done for us. Sales does not have to get a bad rap anymore. Now, the definition of today, when we talk about sales, because of all these factors, is totally different. Yeah, it's kind of driving me crazy, too, right? I was going to misspell sales. <laughs> like I said, my writing's not going to get any better as we go. That's why I'm very, very good at word processing. What is sales today? Well, for one thing, I can define sales as seeking out people companies but let's just let's let's keep it simple seeking out people or those who need my products or services huh what well, doesn't sound so bad I might also call it another way of looking at sales uh, is an interesting quote that goes, you can have everything in life 
that you want. Sounds pretty good so far, right? If you will just help enough people or let's say enough other people, how's that? Makes more sense this way. Other people get what they want. How could it, how could, it can't be that simple. I can have everything if I just help some people get what they already want. That's what sales is looked at today. It's actually honorable. I know, right? One way I like to put it is sales is what you do for people not to them. So this is a much more positive outlook than we talked about before. This is saying, you know what? People have to use what I sell. I just have to find the people that need it bad enough to buy it. One of the best things that you can do to be successful in this business, and again, sales engineers, you're going to have to know this cold. You're going to have to be truly interested in people. Because believe it or not, people buy things. People provide things. People make businesses. How persuasiveness works mechanically. So, one of the things I like to, to use to define this, among many different theories, uh, I like to call it power or perspective management. They're very closely tied together, power and perspective. And let me explain. In this theory, just as we're all players and the world is just a stage, people that you deal with every day, whether it's a sales rep, another sales engineer, a customer prospect, um, somebody making change at the store, they have no script. They play off of you. They react. So if you hand them a script or you play a part that has a counter, and you feed them lines as it is, they will fall into place very quickly as a part of primal conformity. A lot more on that some other time. But what this means is that if you're aware of what's going on, you're the only one that is. <laughs> I'll just tell you that right now. This is so rare in people to be conscious. Even if they're trained on this, they just don't carry it around with them all the time. They're worried about the soccer game. They're worried about whatever. So keeping this present and prescient in your mind can help you tremendously. Just remember, you control who has the perceived power in an interaction with people. And remember, we talked about you really got to like, you can't pretend that you, that you don't like dealing with people. You make two things, there's more, but the, the two biggies are statements and questions in discussions. You're either taking power out of the exchange, you and one or more people, by saying, I believe that it's A. Boom. It is A. Or you're giving power to somebody by saying, is it A? And now they can determine. You're handing the power over to them. It's perceived because it appears as though you're going to give into whatever they decide. Oh, you think it's B? Great, it's B. Let's, let's go with that. I'm not asking you to decide. You think I'm asking you to decide. I'm just asking for your opinion. 
Why? Because if I don't let you talk, I'll let you have no input whatsoever, and there's a, a, a bit of a, a thing involved there uh, with that that's much more detailed than I'm making it seem, then you feel as though even if you agree, when you don't have any input in the situation, you alienate yourself from the solution. It's not my idea, it's their idea. So, statements take power away, and that power has to be wrestled back, right? You're sitting on the big mountain and saying, come and get me, it's A. Questions are giving power. I'm letting you determine the direction. But you know what? If I ask the right question, you're going to come around to my way of thinking. That's because I'm controlling who has the perceived power. I have the power anyway, because I'm the only one who understands what's going on in this discussion. I'm giving it to you, but only because I'm giving it to you for a very good reason. The only choice you have is what I want you to choose. So at Harvard Business School and Stanford University, they did some research and they found out something very simple. You might not actually realize uh, walking around day to day. When facts are on your side, in other words, you're right, questions are more persuasive than statements. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm already right. <laughs> Why am I persuading somebody? I'm already right. If they don't understand that I'm right, well, that's their problem. Well, that's not how sales works, right? That's not how discussions uh, work, right? You have the three A's. That's the way I look, look at it. Where I can acknowledge your position, I can agree with your position that has validity, or that I say, yeah, you know, in your case, that, that's really great. Or I can align, the third step is I can align or ally myself with you, and we're both going to go preach this wonderful new religion that we have. Whole other story about the dynamics of discussion. So, I'm right but I'm still asking questions. What kind of question am I going to ask? Well, one of the problems is being right does not mean that the other person admits that you're right. And sales is a, as we saw before, two-way street, right? I'm going to give you something, you're going to give me something. And again, this has to do with your kids. This has to do with shopping. This has to do with your relationships. This has to do with selling. You're always selling. Are you looking for a job? You're selling yourself. Are you looking to get your kid to go to bed early? Well, you're selling them on that idea, but they're going to want something in return or else they're going to have a temper tantrum and you got to deal with that, right? So what kind of questions would I ask? Well, I can ask you questions that will bring you around to the only inevitable answers to those questions as my viewpoint. As an example, let me give a very, very easy example. A is right, that's what I think, but you think it's B. You're wrong. You might even know that you're wrong. We'll talk about saving face and all that some other time. So, I have to get you to believe it's A. I got to. Why? Remember, we always have the dollars. It always boils down to follow the money. If you don't believe that A is the way to go, I'm never going to get the money for the sale, neither is the rep, or I'm not going to get my kid to go to bed, or I'm never going to be married. I'm going to be a lonely spinster, or whatever they call guys when they're spinsters. I don't know. Something PC fit in there. Now, what do I have to do to convince you? Oh, well, we talked about the questions and such, but let's look at it very basically. I'm not going to get too deep into this. You're welcome. Two things have to happen. One, I have to convince you that B is wrong. Now you just staked your whole reputation, your whole everything. Maybe you spent millions of dollars believing that B was the way to go. And I'm selling you A, which takes you in a totally different direction. You know why? You bought something that if you talked to me initially, you wouldn't have bought because now you've, you're eating that money. You got to figure out some way to recoup that investment or just write it off. 
So that's fine. B is wrong. But now what? I still haven't accomplished my mission, have I? Number two, I have to convince you also that A is right. These two are not the same thing. They're not the same goal, and they're not accomplished in the same exact way. Everything's different, right? Whatever you're selling, uh, whatever you're trying to get people to do or not do, whatever you're trying to get them to buy, whatever their currency is. So you have to think, every situation where you're talking to someone, or you're arguing, or you're convincing them, you have to understand that in order for them to adopt your viewpoint, not just accept it like we said, not just acknowledging, but agreeing with you, that second level in discussion, they have to first admit that what they did was wrong. And to do that, very difficult for people to admit they're wrong, isn't it? So the little aha moment that I'll give you here before we move on is that if I tell you that you are wrong, if I say you are wrong, I've just taken all the power in this whole argument away from you. You have no way out. There's no saving grace. There's no way for you in front of your peers and people that work for you to leave this argument or issue or collaboration with any kind of dignity. I've stripped you of that by saying you are wrong, it is A. Prove it's not. And I know they can't because I'm right. What a horrible position to put somebody in you're trying to get money out of, right? People do this all the time. And that's the, the engineer part of the equation, right? That's why you don't have engineers as sales engineers right out of engineering. They have to be toned down with understanding how sales works. That's why this is so critical, what I'm going over here that seems so trivial. Engineers have to understand psychology. Engineers don't understand psychology. They understand engineering. They understand programming. A sales engineer is the best of both. You get it. You totally get it. I didn't at first. I was just an engineer. I knew everything. That's how I know how hard it is to do. So suppose I give you a way out. I might say something like, at the time, Mr. Prospect, at the time, did you have access to A? Were you able to get A when you made the decision to go with B? Now, what are they going to do with that? Even if I'm wrong, even if I'm suggesting a situation that's not correct, what have I just done? We like to call it giving them a door. So what I just did was, I gave them a door. And that door is a way out. They've got to get out from under this situation. They made the choice, they authorized the choice. Who knows, you make them look bad enough, it could mean their job. I've seen worse. You have to, and again, this goes into the dynamics of discussion. If I have time, I'd love to do a video on this because it's so critical to every person out there. If I don't give you a way out from squeezing you between I'm right and you're wrong, if I'm squeezing you in between here and there's no way out for you, you're never going to buy my product. You're never. <laughs> I'm just causing you grief at this point. Always give somebody a way out in these arguments. This is just one way that it could play out. It's the most common I've seen. Because when it comes time for you, let's say you're selling a displacing technology. We never want to say that. We always want to say it's an enhancing technology that we're selling or enhancing what you've already purchased. But unfortunately, sometimes... It has to be displacing. We're going to get rid of something and put something else in. Change is bad enough for people to deal with. You have to understand 
that simply being right isn't good enough. You have to ask questions in such a way that you give the power of the decision to the prospect. I'll let you think about that. That's that for that. So we're keeping on track, talking about sales engineering, but we're talking about how to be a stellar sales engineer, how to be somebody in high demand. What are the things you need to do better than anybody else? In an encounter, let's call it a sales call, but you can call it getting your kids to take a bath. In a sales call, the best thing that you can do is to, and now you know why, reduce your power and this is in order to give yourself in perspective because remember we talked about power and perspective here's us and here's them them and I'll say this just really quickly I'll gloss over this they will not buy our stuff until we have come to their perspective and what that means is in the perspective circle us and them we get it we see it you know what people don't buy features people don't want to know about all your features they want to know that you understand their issues I'll explain Reduce your perceived power. This helps clarity. They perceive, and perception is reality, right? I'll put that right here. Maybe I should put that in red, but I just want you to remember that. Corner your mind. And if you assume in this encounter that you are the one with the least power and by but when I say assume I mean act what do people like if you're talking to somebody, what, what, what do you people, you've never met the person before. Oh, they're sitting behind their big desk or they're in a big conference room and they've got all of their own people there and there's little old you sitting there at the end. Got mama's position at the turkey table. Feng shui with the door to your back and everything, right? What do people love? They love to feel like they have power because that to them means they're in charge. But how in charge are you when I gave you that power? <laughs> and I only gave you that power in a very specific way to get the job done. That's because while you think you're calling the shots, I am the only one who understands the script going on. And that's how shrewd you have to be. There's a script, there are actors, they all, you've heard it all, snipers, elephants, sharks, right? Door openers, gatekeepers, supporters, champions, right? Uh, coaches, you could write a book. People have read hundreds of books on this, so I don't even have to, to mention any more than that. Now, I always want to communicate that I understand the issues. We'll just call it issues because there's we do a lot more than just fix problems. If I communicate that I understand the issues, understand the issues, it's more persuasive. You remember how we talked about over here the perspective? Well, how am I supposed to understand their problem if I can't put myself in their shoes? What does that mean? Put yourself in somebody else's shoes. One thing. perspective. If I'm sitting in your shoes, if I have your perspective, 
Guess what? I see things the way you see them. I'm standing in your shoes. I have to see things the way you see them. You're standing in your shoes too. So, if there's us, and there's them, and here's problem or opportunity, because I can't stand just saying that we fix problems, you and I both see things the same way, don't we? Now, even if I don't, if I see it from way over here, I am persuasive when they think I do and that I am. Understand? The way I say it is, in a, in a way maybe easier to understand, most people who are right agree with me. Now I have a lot of these some people call them horses back in the day. These are things that I use to make it easy to remember the kind of things I'm saying because there's you learn a lot of things from a lot of different places. Most people who are right agree with me. What am I talking about here? Well, I'm talking about them. <laughs> he writes us. Them having this perspective. I really am over here. And this is our middle ground. But the perception, which is reality, is that I'm really in here. I get you, buddy. I get you, brother. I know what you're in for. I know what you're doing. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Guess what? You do that, and they like you. Why? Because most people who are right agree with me or have the same perspective. Yeah, it's that simple. It's not hard. So, most people make the biggest mistake here, though, is they get into emotion. Um, I understand why you feel Right, those emotional words, that way. Don't say this. This is awful. We're not here to understand anybody's feelings. We, we are not in the empathy business. Right? I'm not here to commiserate with you. I'm here... What is it again? I'm here to make you successful and have you pay me to do it for you at an equitable price simple. You need me, I need your money. Why can't we do business? All this other stuff gets in the way, that's the only reason. Now, one of the things that I'm doing here by matching or paralleling their perspective is, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way, it's called mim, two m's? No, it can't be. Mimicking. I should have looked the word up. Mimicking. Human beings are natural, and I actually think this is a word, mimickers. Does that look right with two M's? This has to do with have you ever heard, uh, be like the person you're talking to? In other words, your posture? Are they open-handed? Are they messing with their fingers? Are they closed up like this? Are they tapping? Right? Mimicking posture. You can probably lump it all into mannerisms. And in the case of speech, one of the things we love to use, there's something called pacing. It's a fabulous technique that we use with irate customers and irate prospects. F super high level version is in pacing, you match the tempo of the person that you're talking to. So they're and you're like, now slow down now, slow down. 
you come up here, so you're both going -da 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 -da, nice and fast, nice and quick, just this is, oh, I'm so angry, oh, so I'm so excited, I'm whatever, and then you lead them down. You can't do it from down here. It's irritating to them when you're that far from their pace. Pacing means I come up here and I slowly come down. Now, when you start to come down, I come down a little more. I go down a little more. I go down a little more. You will follow me because, again, I'm the only one with a script to this play. You don't understand that I'm in control here. I'm letting you feel as though it's your choice. I came up here and you're like, yeah, you're as excited as I am, but they don't notice the fact that I'm bringing them down. I'm taking the steam out of their sails, whatever you want to call it. I'll let that go. Pacing is a huge technique that you should really look up. It's fabulous for dealing with people that are very, very upset. I don't know if it's any good for people that are, you know, feeling good, but definitely great for people that are, that are upset. So you can get them into a rational, accepting state of mind. So, remember... Don't be so different from the people you're trying to get money from. Mimicking is a very, very powerful humanistic thing. So next. Persuasion. Crystal blue. Persuasion, we talked about uh, before. In the case of discussions, I can acknowledge. Some people like to use accept. Yeah, you sure are pissed about that, aren't you? <laughs> I can agree with you. Well, you're right. They shouldn't have done that to you. You have every right to be angry. I would. I wouldn't put up with that. You shouldn't either. And finally, as I get closer and closer, our circles here, I align myself, or, or sometimes uh, you'll hear people call uh, allying. You're my ally. I'm allying myself with you. Let's both go out there and show them what's right. Let's both go give them the business. They're not going to push us around. In what we do, believe it or not, problem solving is not the most valuable asset that you can have. You know what it is? Problem finding. So I might be in this discussion, in this argument about your problems with your software, your business that needs my help. I could be saying, yeah, you're right. I totally agree with you. You need this. But they don't really want me to agree with the problem if it's really something else. That's how you get respect. So if I only solve the problem, and you say, oh, I just need somebody to solve my problem. And I agree that A is the problem. I'm solving your problem. And, and by saying that, I'm saying, um, your identified problem. Uh, you see where I'm going, right? So, I think it's A. Now go fix A. That's a contractor. A consultant, you'd say, what's wrong? Be the problem finder, not the problem solver, is all I'm trying to say. You're far more pers persuasive if you say, you know, you guys have spent a lot of time on this, and you certainly have seen this, but you know what? I'm a little further away from the problem. It might be, and this is again how you save face, even though you doubt that it's A, you could say, well, maybe it's A and something else. A compound problem. We don't know. Hey, I never thought about that. We only thought it was A. Okay? You're opening people up to the possibility. They're like, you know what? We never thought of that. I didn't even come up with a solution. I just came up with a question. What do you think? Are you dead certain it's A and only A? So what we're saying here, in this part of persuasion, I love to tell people, sell holes 
not drills. That's how you're persuasive. And that's why you need to be a problem finder and not necessarily a problem solver. They got tons of problem solvers. Just tell them what to solve. They'll go do it. So, I'm going to sum this up for you. Perception is reality. That should be tattooed someplace on your body or at least in your cubicle or whatever it is you, you work in. I'm going to tell you that there are only two critical skills that you need to be a rock star sales engineer. Just wait a minute. You went through all that? For two things? Yeah, I did. The first thing you need to do out of the two, identify and qualify, and I've gone through a lot about this on my blog, qualification, but I want to do a video about it as well, spread the graphics and stuff uh, that I've made. Identify and qualify buyers. Bomb. Done. Number one. Number two, that's on the sales side. As an engineer, you've got to be able to explain what you're selling. Look at that. Four words. Well, you can count that as one. Four words as well. Four and four. What does this let you do? It lets you, therefore, explain, produce, whatever you want to call it, what life or business with our stuff in your environment will look like. Remember? Holes, not drills. This leads you to demo. Thank you very much. This is the end of the second video. I hope you found it useful.